Yeah. All right. Well, let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to, to gather here and to continue our study of your word. Bless us as we continue to look through 1 Samuel, uh, that we may learn more about the, the happenings of, of your people uh, during this time of, of Samuel and Eli and, uh, and, and that how uh, you work uh, through, through your people. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so we are in 1 Samuel chapter 2. So we went through Hannah's prayer, Hannah's song, kind of comparing that with, with Mary's song, the Magnificat in, in the, the New Testament there, uh, looking at a lot of those similarities. Uh, and then we got in, in, in verse 12, we, we got into kind of looking at Eli's sons, and, and we're, we're seeing that they're, they're not exactly pious, righteous men, um, that, that they are not working their, their vocation as priests very faithfully. Um, they're, they're not following the, the law that God had set through Moses as far as, you know, what meat is, is set aside for the priest to have. They say, we want more. We want the fatty stuff. We want that good, good food. And, you know, the, the meat that is supposed to be set aside for, for the Lord, for, for offering to him. Um, and so, so, so they are, they're not taking it, you know, they don't really care what the Lord is saying, right? We, we see that in verse 12. They, they did not know the Lord, um, that, you know, they, they knew that he, they knew about him, of course, but, but this shows a, a, a deeper knowledge of a, a faith, right? They didn't really believe or care much about what, what God was saying to them. And so, so hence why they, they practiced the, the way they did. And, and this is just, and, and we'll see a little bit more of, of what they are doing when we get into verse 22, uh, where Eli will finally uh, rebuke his sons after, you know, a long period of hearing about all of this stuff happening. Um, so, but we're, before we get into that, we're going to see uh, just a, a quick mention of, about Samuel and kind of um, what, what he's up to and, and his parents visit him. Uh, so, uh, if someone could read 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 18 through 21. But Samuel, though he was only a boy, served the Lord. He wore a linen garment like that of a priest. Each year his mother made a small coat for him and brought it to him when he came, <coughs> when she came with her, sir, with her husband for the sacrifice. Before they returned home, Eli would bless Elkanah, yeah, Elkanah, or, Elkanah yeah. mm-hmm. and his wife and say, May the Lord give you other children to take the place of this one she gave to the Lord. And the Lord blessed Hannah, and she conceived and gave birth to three sons and two daughters. Meanwhile, Samuel grew up in the presence of the Lord. All right, so, so yeah, so Samuel, in, in this meantime, right, he's, he's serving. He's still a boy, he's still young, but he's, he's serving under Eli, helping with, with all of the, the priestly duties. Um, and so, so he's engaged in that life, and, 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 and he's living there. And we, we kind of talked about this a little bit last week, how, you know, oh, does, does she kind of, you know, the, uh, Samuel's mom just kind of leave him at the, the tabernacle and, and never see him again. Right? Well, we see here that that's not the case, that, that they're coming up regularly for feasts and, and we'll, we'll see him there and, and, and you know, make him a new robe for, for each year because, you know, they, they he's don't... He, yeah, he's growing and, and, and there's, you know, they don't have a, a full wardrobe of, of clothes to cycle through, right? Probably just had, a, you know... One, two robes, yeah, you know, that kind of thing. And so they would wear out and he would get bigger, of course. And so, so she's bringing him robes and, and they're, they're seeing him every, every time they come up. And, and then Eli gives this blessing to them uh, that, you know, may, may the Lord bless you with, with more children. Right? You, you've dedicated this son to, to serve the Lord here at the tabernacle. And so because you have done this, this righteous thing, you, you've kept your word, you've kept your promise to this, may, may the Lord bless you with, with even more children. And, and the Lord does so. 
uh, we, we see that, that she ends up having three more sons and, and two daughters. Would she have been rather older then? Or not necessarily? Uh, not necessarily. Um, yeah, we, we don't get an, an age suggestion or anything. We just, we see that... Um, I imagine so, because she kind of had a slow start with her other wife had already was conceiving and giving birth. Yeah, it, it's possible that, that she's older, pr probably not to the, you know, what, what we saw in Genesis with, you know, like Sarah, where, where she's in her, you know, 80s and 90s, probably not that old, right. because, no. because it makes that point to say that, you know, she's 90 and she's having a kid, right, you know, uh, where we don't get that here, so it's probably not that extreme old age but it but it could it could be you know older certainly older than than one would normally start bearing children at, at that age so so yeah so so she has you know three sons two daughters uh, we we see god you know bestows these blessings uh, upon uh, upon hannah and and Cana there and and then samuel uh, now right you know we get 20 and tw the end of 21 and the young man Samuel grew in the presence of the Lord. Right, so he's so he's continuing to grow. He, we we see kind of it's kind of a a time lapse almost of of Samuel that, that we saw him as a, as a you know a baby. Now we you know we've we've seen him as as a a young boy, and now he's you know growing into a young man, and 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 so so he he's getting older. Um, but in, in his in his presence well, and serving there, really. yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. So, any any questions on on this little section here before we get back to to Eli's sons? All right, uh, if someone could read verses twenty two through twenty six. Now Eli, who was very old heard about everything his sons were doing to all Israel and how they slept with the women who served at the entrance to the tent of meeting. So he said to them, why, why do you do such things? I hear from all the people about these wicked deeds of yours. No, my sons, it is not a good report that I hear spreading among the Lord's people. If a man sins against another man, God may mediate for him but if a man sins against the Lord who will intercede for him his sons however did not listen to their father's rebuke for it was the Lord's will to put them to death and the boy Samuel continued to grow in statue and in favor with the Lord the Lord and with men all right so so eventually the behavior gets so bad from from Eli's sons right that that they're you know sleeping with the the women who are serving at the the entrance you know the tent of meeting right that was part of the tabernacle and so so the, these women who are there to to serve the Lord in this way right the Eli's sons are, are sleeping with them and and that of course is not priestly behavior <laughs> um, not you know not behavior that anyone in Israel should should have you know at that time but especially not the priests and, and so so finally Eli rebukes them and and you know he he says that you know he asks why they're doing these things I'm getting this evil report from you or from the people of these things you're doing um, and and he you know he he doesn't really and, and th this is part of the issue that that we'll see in this next section, right? He's telling them that they're, you know, that oh, I, I'm hearing you do all these bad things, but but there's never really an admonition from him that you know, at least specifically of you need to stop your behavior. It's just kind of hey, this is bad, and hoping that they'll connect the dots and say, oh yeah, I guess we should stop doing this kind of thing. So it's kind of a soft rebuke from from Eli. Um, you know, you know, he says, you know, if if someone sins against a man, God will mediate for him. But if someone sins against the Lord, who can intercede for him? And so it kind of stops there. Um, and and so, you know, the the nice answer he, you know, this this set of questions here that he gives uh, kind of gives a foreshadowing to to our sinful situation where where we as people right by our sin we have sinned against the lord and 
you know, the question, well, who can intercede for us? Well, the, the answer really is only God himself. And, and we see this with Christ, right? Jesus becomes our mediator by, by coming and, you know, paying for our sins and, you know, ascending to the right hand of the Father. And so, you know, he, he is our great mediator, you know, between us and the Father. Um, and so, so we get kind of a, a little picture here of, of that. Um, and so, um, but we, we see that, that Eli's sons don't listen to the voice of their father, right? They don't, they don't change their ways. And, and we get this, on the, on the surface, it can seem kind of like a troubling statement um, that, right, you know, in the ESV here it says, but they would not listen to the voice of their father, for it was the will of the Lord to put them to death. And so, right, it, on the surface, it seems like, well, well God, why would you why would you do that, right? Why would you, you know, harden their heart in this way where they wouldn't repent because you had determined to, to destroy them? And I, I think a, a helpful way to, to look at this, a helpful example is to think about Pharaoh in, in the, the time of Exodus. That, you know, Moses and Aaron, they, they go to Pharaoh and they say, let the Israelites go, right? Let, let, let my people go. And, and Pharaoh says, no, of course. And what, what we see in the text through, throughout that whole process, because of course then, you know, you know, God uses Moses to turn the Nile River to blood. And, and then there's all, you know, the, all the 10 plagues. And in between each of the plagues, right, Moses goes again, you know, after turning the river to blood, he goes to Pharaoh again, says, all right, here's, right, that we've, <laughs> this is plague number one, right, you know, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, no. And so then plague number two comes, right? And it's, it's the, you know, rinse and repeat kind of thing. And what we see throughout, I'm, I forget the exact number, but what we see with the first probably three or four plagues and the, and the three or four times that Moses comes to Pharaoh is that it talks about how Pharaoh hardens his own heart, right? That, that he, he's unwilling to listen to Moses, unwilling to listen to the Lord. And so, so for the first few times, he hardens his own heart, right? To, that he will not listen to, to Moses or, or to God. And then a- eventually it shifts the language where, where it says that, that God hardens Pharaoh's heart. Um, and, and the idea being is that, you know, Pharaoh had time to to say, yeah, I'll, I'll let you guys go, right? You know, that'll be fine. I'll, I'll listen to what your God is, is telling us. But he doesn't. He says, no, I'm going to have it my way. And he, and he does this time and time again until it's, it's to the point where it's very clear that he's not really going to do this you know, and, and of his own will. And so then it, it switches to a point where, where God then uses Pharaoh to, to prove a point. Right, that he, he hardens his heart, brings him through, you know, through all the ten plagues, um, ultimately to the final one, right, which is the, the death of all of the firstborn Egyptians, and, or at least all of the firstborn families who don't put the, the blood of the lamb on, on their doorposts. Um, a great prefiguring of, of Jesus' death on the cross. Uh, and, and so, right, it's, it's that when, you know, God has... You know, sent all of these plagues. He, he's in, and in this, you know, each each plague is such a really cool study, right? Each plague is a very specific attack against uh, Egyptian deities, right? So, so turning the Nile to blood. Well, the Nile was a, a god for them, right? They worshipped the Nile, and so turning the Nile to blood was a very big object lesson of my god has the power to kill your gods, right? Um, and so each each god that, or each plague that is sent is basically God saying and showing, trying to show Pharaoh, I'm more powerful than the gods you worship. Right? These these things that you value, these things that you think are are so powerful. Look at my control over them. And so so anyway, so he so he he does this. Pharaoh still doesn't want to repent. Uh, and, and listen. So then God hardens his heart to, you know, to the final plague. And then finally, Pharaoh says, fine, 
just just get out of here. And then, of course, he changes his mind and <laughs> sends the armies after uh, to try and get get the Israelites back. What would the frogs have anything to do? I'm trying to remember. Um, remember all the ten different. Yeah, I'm trying to remember the specific ones. Um, yeah, there there was there was some. Yeah, I, I would have to look it up, but. Yeah, there there was a tie, a connection to to some Egyptian deity, um, in, in in each of the plagues. Yeah. Um, so right, so when we so when we look at right Eli's sons here, you know, it, it, Eli is not coming to them and rebuking them. You know, the first time that they're falling out of line, right? They they have. You know, they've been in the habit of, of not following the Lord, of doing all the stuff with the sacrifices, and, and we see their sin getting worse and worse, right? You know, they're, they're you know, not listening with all of the sacrifices, how they're supposed to do those things, which, you know, they should be, and that is sin in the eyes of the Lord. Uh, but it's not as bad, you know, as far as, you know, earthly consequences go. It's not as bad as going around sleeping with other people, right? And so, so the, the, we, we see that as, as they're continuing in their sin, their sin is getting worse and worse and worse. And so, and then finally, you know, here at the end, Eli finally steps in and, and, and says, this is bad what you guys are doing. And so by, by this point, we, I think we could probably mi- connect what we see with the sons to what we see with Pharaoh, that the sons have had ample time to... You know, they, they knew the law. They knew what they were supposed to do, but they were choosing not to. They were choosing to do something different. So they've been given plenty of time to, to turn from their, their sin, to, to do what is right. Uh, but instead, they've chosen not to follow what the Lord has said, to do their own thing. So they've been kind of, in a way, hardening their own hearts against what God desires. And so when it, when it finally gets to this point, God has decided you know, and seen, right, that they're not, they're not going to repent anyway. And so I'm going to use this to then teach Eli. And the Lord's going to actually, in the next section, rebuke Eli for, for not managing his house well, not stopping this sooner. Because Eli was, right, he was the high priest. So he was in the position, and what he should have done was when he heard his sons doing this, he should have rebuked them right away. And if they continued to do so, then he had the authority and the responsibility to remove them from officiating as priests. Right? That's what he should have done when, when, when they weren't following. Um, but he didn't, right? You know, either out of you know not wanting to create conflict with his sons or you know that that kind of thing. You know, family dynamic there. Um, and and so. Um, kind of a rack and a hard place, hoping that he's, his sons will come to see the light and turn around and change. And yeah. Hope, hope that hope alive, but still. Right, yeah. Tough, tough situation for sure. Um, but yeah, so, so, so we see kind of what their fate is going to be um, because they have willingly followed in this sin. Um, so I think that connection between them and looking at Pharaoh is kind of a helpful way to think about it rather than, you know, just looking at it and being like, oh, God wanted them dead? That doesn't seem like a loving thing to do kind of, you know, kind of thing there. Um, so so we, we, he tries to rebuke his sons. The sons say no. They're going to continue to to do what they want. Um, again, right, for, further committing their sins. Right now, you know, they've been doing all of these sins you know, against these other people, and now they are breaking the fourth commandment, right? They're not honoring their father and what he is telling them to do. Um, so they're continuing in that, in that sin. Um, and then we get this note uh, about Samuel, though, right? We get kind of the, 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 the bad examples, and then we get the good example uh, of Samuel, right? Now the young man Samuel, he continued to grow uh, both in stature and in favor with the Lord and also with man. Right, so, so Samuel, he's continuing, continuing to serve. He, he's growing not only physically, uh, but also spiritually and in his faith. Um, and, you know, the, the Lord is pleased with, with what Samuel is doing. He's not pleased with Eli's sons, and he's not pleased with Eli himself, as we'll see in this next section. Uh, but he is pleased with Samuel, that Samuel seems to be serving in a faithful way. Um, 
And so he, he's growing in favor with the Lord and also with, with the people, that, that the people see him, see that he's serving faithfully, you know, not like Eli's sons who are threatening their, their lives to give him the fatty meats and that kind of thing. Samuel is serving faithfully. And so, so the, the people uh, view him very highly as well. So, so we get kind of this, you know, Eli's sons are, are on this, you know, are decreasing in, in the view of the Lord and of the people. And Samuel is, is increasing. So, so it's, it's setting the scene for, for this switch that eventually we'll see where, where Eli will cease to be the high priest, you know, the priest of God's people, and Samuel will take over as, as the new high priest. Um, so, and we'll see more of that scene getting set up in this next section. Um, God's going to talk about raising up a high priest for himself, uh, which is an immediate reference to Samuel, but also ultimately a, a reference to Jesus, the true high priest um, that, that we see. So, any questions on this business with Eli's sons? Um, so they want the fatty bits. So they want they're after the bacon. Yeah, probably. Probably after the bacon, I guess. Yeah, and and this this would have been um, so it, it wouldn't it 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 would it would have been like that. Um, I, I, right. I understand. I'm just looking. For yeah, a, a comparison, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure. <laughs> So, but yeah, right, yeah, they, they want that, you know, the, the, the juicy, fatty, right, those, you know, those parts. And Let the brisket cook. Right, cook. yeah, yeah, and, and so that's what they're after, yep. All right, well, let's get into the next section then. Um, let's see here. I think it's from sitting in this chair that Fran usually sits in. She's usually got a couple of the one-liners that come out. Yeah, yeah, she, that's right. Maybe I should. It just, it just <laughs> osmosis right through the chair. <laughs> uh, love you, Fran, if, if you're going to watch this later. Um, all right, I'll go ahead and read this next section. It's a, um, I'll just read through the, the rest of the chapter here. So verses 27 uh, to the end through 36. And there came a man of God to Eli and said to him, Thus the Lord has said, Did I indeed reveal myself to the house of your father when they were in Egypt, subject to the house of Pharaoh? Did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to go up to my altar, to burn incense, to wear an ephod before me? I gave to the house of your father all my offerings by fire from the people of Israel. Why then do you scorn my sacrifices and my offerings that I commanded, and honor your sons above me by fattening yourselves on the choicest parts of every offering of my people Israel? Therefore the Lord, the God of Israel, declares, I promised that your house and the house of your father should go in and out before me forever. But now the Lord declares, Far be it from me, for those who honor me I will honor. And those who despise me, I shall be lightly, er, who despise me, shall be lightly esteemed. Behold, the days are coming when I will cut off your strength and the strength of your father's house, so that there will not be an old man in your house. Then, in distress, you will look with, with envious eyes on all the prosperity that shall be bestowed on Israel, and there shall not be an old man in your house forever. The only one of you whom I shall not cut off from my altar shall be spared to weep his eyes out, to grieve his heart, and all the descendants of your house shall die by the sword of men. And this that shall come upon you, on your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, shall be the sign to you. Both of them shall die on the same day. And I will raise up for myself a faithful priest, who shall do according to what is in my heart and in my mind. And I will build him a sure house, and he shall go in and out before my anointed forever. And every one who is left in your house shall come to implore him for a piece of silver or a loaf of bread, and shall say, Please put me in one of the priest's places, that I may eat a morsel of bread. So, word of the Lord to Eli is not, <laughs> not a pleasant one. Um, so, so we, we start off here, it says, there, there came a man of God to Eli. So, so this is most likely a, a, a prophet w within that time. We don't know who it would have been. 
um, but you know that we we had there, there were different functions often within the, the people of Israel so so the priests of course had their function they were in the tabernacle later in the temple offering the sacrifices offering up prayers those kinds of things oftentimes separate from them sometimes sometimes united but but often separate we would you would have the the role of prophet uh, and, and the prophets were, were men who were called by God not to do sacrifices. That was the priest's job. Uh, but the prophet would, would you know, be given a word from the Lord and then speak that to whomever he was supposed to speak it to. So whether that's to the whole house of Israel or here, in this case, specifically to Eli. So, so again, we don't know who this prophet would have been. Uh, but God calls this this prophet to go and bring this word to uh, to Eli. Uh, we we see this uh, lots of times throughout throughout the the scriptures um, that this is often how how God, especially in this era how God will choose to communicate to His people. Um, so right, this prophet does this with Eli. Another example of this is um, when when David has his whole situation with Bathsheba and killing her husband Uriah, um, right? God doesn't come to and, and speak, you know, himself necessarily, uh, but he, he chooses to speak through the prophet Nathan. So, so he sends Nathan to come to, to da- David and say, thus saith the Lord, boom, um, you're the man, right? <laughs> you're, the, you're the sinner. And so, so this is how we see God kind of working through, throughout uh, most of, of Old Testament Israelite history. Um, and a lot of the prophets that we see in the Old Testament, you know, that serve this role, you know, Elijah, Elisha, um, Isaiah, right? You know, all these, all these different prophets uh, would have served in this way. So, so we don't know who it is, but, but some prophet, uh, most likely, comes and, and speaks with, with Eli on this. And then, so, so he goes in, and he, he makes this, this accusation against Eli uh, that, that Eli right, is, is not honoring the Lord as he should. And, and what, what we see is a, is a connection here and a way of thinking that, that we don't always necessarily think of nowadays. Uh, but the, the, the family unit, right, in this time was, was responsible for each other, right? Especially the, the, the father with the sons, right? The, the sons were, were viewed as an extension of, of the father. And so, you know, think, think of like, you know, a, a father telling his, his sons, right, you, you need to behave well because, right, you have my name, right? You know, you, you're a Patterson. And so if you do something bad, right, that's going to that's gonna reflect on me. So, so stay in line. Um, that's what's happening here a lot is, is that Eli is, is not managing his house well, right? He, even though his sons are, you know, probably a, adults at this point, there's still there's still that connection there, and Eli still has authority to he should be anyway stepping in and trying to correct that, and so so when the Lord is speaking this way, how how Eli is not you know that he's making a mockery of the sacrifices and that he's doing doing all of this, you know that's it's by extension of his sons, but Eli has kind of tolerated this, so so that that tolerance. Uh, and inaction to to stop it from happening is you know in in the the eyes of the Lord connected with with that sin so so that's where he's kind of coming from here um, and saying right I, I set up this this great you know priestly people right your fathers before you all the way back right I you know I raised up these priests I delivered you know your people out of Egypt uh, in you know out of slavery and made you priests, and, and now this is how you're acting, right? This is how you're, you're dishonoring me and with these sacrifices, and you're, you're taking the, the, the choicest parts of every offering, you know, for, for yourselves. Um, and, and, so, and, and so, right, he, he lays all of that before him, right? That 
basically saying this this is the sin that you have committed right you've allowed this to happen and so by connection you you are engaged in that at some point though those those the sons are going to be old enough to make their own intelligent decisions where they're kind of starting to become above the reproach from the parents the parents may have suggestions to the kids but then the the kids may still are a young adult that they uh, make up their own mind although mm-hmm. these guys were already uh, swinging pretty strongly to the to the wrong side there but um, at some point we'll help what we'll, Eli would be losing control, obviously, right. to, to their own will, the free will of their own sons. Yeah, I, I think that the, the big difference that we see here, and in, in let's say, you know, per, perhaps with us, when, when our, our children get old enough to kind of go their own direction, it is that, that Eli, is, his, his vocation as high priest, has the authority to stop his sons from committing these sins as priests. Um, that that it's, it's less of a, you know, oh, well, you're their father, and so you should stop them. But it's more as, you know, yes, you are their father, but also you are the high priest. So and, what kind of authority is he going to have? Don't do that, Billy. You shouldn't be playing with this, you know, or doing that. I mean, all I can do is say it. Well, as the high priest, he could have dismissed them from their priestly office. So, so he could have said, you guys are no longer priests. And so, you, yeah, you're, you're no longer priests. You can no longer offer the sacrifices, those kinds of things. So I think that's the big difference here. And they probably wouldn't have had a job. Right. They, and they, they would have, right, because they, they would have had to, because they wouldn't have had their own land, right, because they're of, of the, the, the priestly line. And so, so it would have been a severe blow to them. Um, but... But, you know, that's probably what should have been done anyway. And then, you know, they, they would probably done something. I guess present through my actions that they may see with their eyes mm-hmm. of a different way. Just to a different, I don't know if I'm making any kind of sense to this. Yeah, but yeah. But uh, uh, so it's tough to want them to, to bring them around to a... a what I see Mm -hmm. not to say that it's my way but it should be I would hope for everybody's way right yeah so I see some similarities there so I hate the thought that they're going to come into battle and and later to find out that I'm gonna fall over and bump my head and that's it right yeah yeah and 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 I think that right that that there is that difference in right their vocations, right, as as high priests and, and then priests in, in the office, right? They 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 should have been dismissed from from that that office. Um, but I don't have that choice. It's family, so right? It's just... And and so so I think I think you're you're doing what you can, right? And and outside of this situation, I think that's that's all a father can do is you know point to how you know to to what has been taught and show them in your life that, you know, this is how we honor the Lord and this is what we're supposed to do. Uh, but ultimately it is their choice to, to walk away from that if, if they so desire. And so we pray for them. We, we, you know, just try and be that light, you know, reflecting. And then that continues as long as we live. As long as we live. Yeah. So, so I, yeah, I, I think that's, you know, a, a faithful course. Um, but in this specific situation, you have the high priest authority with the priestly action, and that, that brings in that element of, all right, Eli, you, sh- you had the authority to do something, and you chose not to, kind of thing. So, so he was one up on me. Okay, I'm good. <laughs> I'm so good. All good. <clears throat> yeah, so, 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 yeah, so he says that this is what has been happening. These are the sins you've been committing. Um, and then we, we get kind of the, the, the punishment here, right? That basically, and, and we see a little bit of, of I, w- I wouldn't say grace with, with Eli, uh, but right, Eli's sons, as we see, are going to 
fall in battle, right? They they are going to perish in in battle, um, and Eli doesn't. He he he's not gonna die in battle. Uh, we will see him him die at, at the at the news of of the 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 results of the battle, um, you know. Uh, but but he 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 won't face death in battle, which is you know like a a better. It's a better way to die not in battle than in battle, I guess, um, if you want to look at it that way. Um, you know, a small mercy, maybe. Who knows? Um, <laughs> if, if you want to look at it you know, that way. Uh, but, but, right, he delivers the news, right, that, that, that Eli's sons are, are going to perish for their sin, for their rejection of God, uh, that, that Eli's line is, is going to end. Right, and this is what they're, it gets at when it talks about that there won't be an old man in your house. Right, when there's an old man in your house, that means that you know they've been living long, right, and and people are having children. Like your line is continuing, um, but but if there's live long and prosper. That's right, live long and prosper. That's right. Um, and it's, it's the chair. I'm sure it's the chair. It must be. Yeah, it's confirming for us. Yeah. <laughs> And so, yeah, that that you're basically he's saying your your line is going to end, right? Your your sons will die, um, and and your your house is over, um, which again might might seem kind of harsh, but but again the the Lord we we always want to remember that the Lord is true. He is the truest form of of love of of mercy, but also justice. Right, so so whenever the Lord sees fit to bring punishment, we always need to remember that He is perfectly just. So so whatever the Lord does, any punishment that He gives, must be a just punishment. And and so so when we look at you know the situation here, even though right, we, we might want to say, well, couldn't He have gone a little softer or right, been a little more gracious or, or that kind of thing. Um, Apparently not. Uh, it 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 seems that, that the Lord has saw fit to to act this way to bring about this punishment for for Eli and his sons, and so so we kind of have to you know put aside our own thoughts of of what is right and what is wrong, and say you know the the Lord is the one who knows best, and so His will be done. That this is what was was just in in this situation. Uh, which can be a hard pill to swallow sometimes, uh, because sometimes we we see things happen and say that that doesn't seem loving, or you know it seems too harsh of a of a judgment. But but that that's always a reflection of our sinfulness, of our lack of understanding the ways of God and, and what is truly right. Um, it, it's it's always a problem on our end, not not on the Lord's end. Um, and so we're very quick to say it's, it's the Lord's fault because he didn't do it the way I would have done it. But the reality is the way we do it is, is not, we're, we're well, not Well, if you can see in your heart, too, to know, okay, maybe you do deserve some, a little slack here. Or, right, yeah. Or you just bad to the core. Right, yeah. He, he, he's the, alone can see, read the heart and see what's in it. So when he sees the sons of Eli, he knows... There's there's no repentance there. There's no faith. There, right? That's all gone, and so so bringing about this punishment, you know, we would like to think, oh well, maybe there's there's a chance that they could have repented and turned. The Lord saw in His wisdom, of, in His omniscience, it wasn't going to happen, right? And so so He brings that punishment. There's never a situation in which God brings judgment against someone that if they would have just been given a little bit more time. Then they then they would have repented and and been a Christian, right? The the Lord knows He sees all things. He knows all things. He operates outside of time itself, right? And, and so, so there there's never a situation in which, you know, let let's say, let's say someone someone is is not a Christian, and they're they're living their life and they get in a car accident and die. You know, there, there's never a situation in which, oh, well, if God would have kept them, 
from dying in that car accident, then maybe they would have started going to church and, and being a Christian, right? God in his omniscience would have seen that this this person would never believe. And, and so, right, it, it's, it's not as if God messed up and, you know, allowed him, this person, to die too early or, or that kind of thing. So, um, again, kind of a hard thing to wrestle with, especially when we look at, you know, real life situations and especially when those real life situations hit real close to home it can be very hard to to keep that idea that that god is completely just he's always doing what's right and and you know he he always works for the good of those who love him and so i right it's it's hard to cling to those things in those tough times but but that's what we see with god so with, with Eli's sons and with Eli, right, this is a just punishment that is being brought about. And, you know, our, our answer in all that the Lord does should, should be God be praised. And it's easy to say that when it's a nice thing. It's not so easy to say God be praised when, when punishment's being given out or that kind of thing. So, true, true. so, so yeah, so we see that here that, that Eli's sons are going to perish. Um, but we, we end with this note that that God is not just doing away with you know with all the priests. He's not doing away with with all Israel uh, because of this sin. But but He says, "I'm going to raise up a faithful priest. Right? I will I will continue to have someone who will minister to God's people faithfully, unlike your sons, and and, and unlike you." And I will raise up this faithful priest. He will serve. He will go in and out before me. In, in my presence, um, this kind of thing. And, and we will see this with, again, as I said, most immediately we see this with Samuel. Now, he's not the, the true great high priest that we see in Jesus, right? Jesus is, is that great high priest. We get that uh, in, in Hebrews. I forget the exact chapter. But the talk of, of Jesus being our great high priest. Um, and, well, let me, let me look for it real quick. It's just really nice. I want to say Hebrews chapter 4, but let me... Uh, well, it might be, well, it talks about it a lot, actually. <laughs> um, let's see. Maybe it's here in 7, because Jesus is being compared to Melchizedek who is a priest in the Old Testament. Uh, do, 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 do. Um, let's see, so it's, um, I'm reading from Hebrews chapter 7, verses uh, 23. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he, uh, but, but he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. This is Jesus. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. So there's that intercession connection there, mediation. Uh, for it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separate, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins, and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men in their weakness as high priests, but the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. Um, and then it, it continues to go on, um, talking about Christ as high priest. Uh, in, in chapter 9... Uh, verse 11 uh, says, But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify, for the purification of the flesh. How much more will the blood of Christ, 
who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. So the, so Hebrews spends a lot of time talking about the, the old covenant, new covenant, Jesus as both high priest offering the sacrifice and himself as that sacrifice. And so it delves a, a whole lot into what, what God here, through, through this prophet, is, is promising to Eli that, that he will raise for himself a, a faithful priest. Uh, and, and this is ultimately fulfilled in Jesus, right? That he is the perfect and final high priest, uh, that he lives forever. He offered the, the one sacrifice of his own body for, for the sins of all the world. And so no longer are any sacrifices needed, right? Samuel, the kind of immediate fulfillment of this, will continue to have to offer the animal sacrifices over and over and over again. You know, this is why the people continued to have to bring sacrifices because they, they would offer the sacrifice. They'd rather bring it to the priest and the priest would offer the sacrifice and that would cover them for a time, but then they would fall back into sin and then there would have to be another sacrifice. Right? The, the, the sacrifice of these animals was never sufficient to eternally cover uh, these people. Uh, but, but the sacrifice of Jesus, right, of, of God himself on behalf of man, is that final sacrifice that that is enough to cover all people um, and so it is e eternally providing forgiveness for us and so so this talk of right that of, of this this priest is ultimately fulfilled in jesus uh, but we also see it with, with samuel right he he's going to be a, a faithful uh, priest at least for for most of his time um, he, he will also have, of course, he's, he's a sinful human being, just like we all are, and so he's not going to be perfect either. Uh, in fact, he also is going to have some trouble with his sons, just like Eli had trouble with, with his own sons. So, so we'll see kind of, you know, that, that connection there. Um, you know, it's, it, you, can, you can think of it almost in a way of, you know, the, the, the sins of your father, you... you you know, you're almost more prone to fall into. Um, and so Eli, in a, in a real sense, is, is his spiritual father, right? Because they, you know, hand, you know, Elkanah, of course, is his, is his actual father. Uh, but, he, but Samuel is spending a whole lot more time under the, the training and the raising of Eli than he is of, of, Sam, of, of Elkanah. And so... So it's it's possible that that we see there that you know he's he's essentially raised by Eli and the the sins of Eli kind of carry over almost not not carry over as if Samuel were were bound to have these problems too but um, but we see a, a similar struggle that that Samuel will will have just as Eli did so but this this uh, but he but he will serve faithfully. Um, in, in, in his office. So, so, so we see that there. So any, any questions on uh, the, the word of the Lord to Eli? Or to, yeah, to Eli and about his house. Pretty neat. Thanks. So. Yeah. So we'll go ahead and, and, and call it there. Uh, so, so next, so we, we are not meeting this next Tuesday because I'll be out of town. So... So we'll resume not not this next week, but but the following one. I forget the date on that. But twenty fifth. That sounds right. So the eighteenth. So, so yeah, the the eighteenth. Yeah, out. next we won't we won't meet on the eighteenth, but the following one nice. we we should. So so on that day we'll we'll get into chapter three, um, and this is that this is that you know familiar Sunday school story of of God calling Samuel and he. he Samuel, Samuel, and he runs in. Eli, I'm here. And Eli's like, "Hey, go to bed. I wasn't calling you." <laughs> and so, so we'll, so we'll look at that and um, kind of see all the the context there. So, let's close with prayer. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your faithfulness to us, uh, even when we are not faithful. We thank you for the forgiveness that you offer to us, that when we do fall short of your law or when we, when we reject you, that, that when we come in repentance and, and we turn from our sin, that, that you bountifully forgive us uh, of that sin. Keep us from uh, walking in ways that would, would lead to a rejection of you and your word. Keep us ever steadfast in your truth that, that we would find joy in, in following your will for us and keeping to your word. Bless us as we go about our business this week that, that we would be kept from temptation, uh, that we would best love you and love and serve our neighbor. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thanks, guys. Thank you.